Father, this morning we gather to say thank you. Thank you that we can declare, I am redeemed. That because you sent Jesus into this world to be the sacrifice for our sins, to suffer and die on the cross for us, you have rescued us from hell, you have given us life and hope and peace, and have adopted us into your family. For that, we cannot praise you enough or thank you enough. So this morning, we simply gather to praise you and to listen to you. So we pray that you would speak to us now, that we would hear your voice as we open your word, and you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your uh, Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. Uh, Luke is the third Gospel out of four. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's okay. Grab one of these in the pews around you. Turn to page 1,125. Uh, you know, uh, and by the way, if you need a Bible, you don't have one, uh, you want to read the Word of God, feel free to take one of these with you uh, right out of the pew or there's a table out front uh, on your way out. You can grab one and help yourself to it. Uh, as we like to say, if you're going to use it, take it. If you're going to you know, take it to the swap meet and sell it, leave it. <laughs> so, but we want you to have the Word of God and let it change your life. Hey, uh, happy Easter. <laughs> really? Okay. Uh, hey, we're, I, I'm glad you're here. So did you have fun getting ready for church this morning? Yeah, some of you did. Some of you are like, eh, not so much. So, uh, yeah, okay, let's just confess. How many of you bought a new outfit for Easter, something new? Yeah, there's like four hands that went up, right? Things are not what they used to be, are they? My goodness, when I was growing up going to, you know, church on Easter, it was a big deal. Yeah, all the women had to buy dresses and hats and, you know, all the kids were decked up. By the way, you know, some of you are still dressing the, the kids up and, and they look sweet, don't they? You know, all the little dresses and things like that. Love that. But, you know, I just got to tell you that I wasn't a big fan of getting dressed up for Easter when I was a kid. You know, kind of scarred because my mom put me in this little short pants suit. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one. And I'm still feeling the effects because I had older brothers and I had a short pants suit on and they're like making fun of me and teasing me and I'm still scarred. <laughs> Working on that whole forgiveness thing with my mom on that. So uh, anyway, but I, I got to tell you, as much as I hated getting dressed up for Easter, I loved it when my wife did this for our, our girls when they were little. Yeah, all the little frilly dresses and stuff. But it wasn't just me that went through that whole, you know, getting dressed up for Easter thing. There's lots of us that... <laughs> You know, got to do that. And uh, there he is, <laughs> waiting, right? Because the whole best part about the whole Easter Sunday morning is, is the fact that once you get dressed and you're all, you know, up, your mom's still got to get ready. And what does she tell you? Moms, what do you tell the kids? Yeah, don't get dirty. Don't get dirty. So now here you are, a little boy. Yeah, by the way, his son looks just like this. If you want to see him in the flesh, you just find his four-year-old, and, he, and he's running around just like that. But, you know, your mom says you don't get dirty, and there you are as this kid, and you're a little boy, and you just want to play, you want to do something, you want to eat, and there's no way you want to spend the next 20 minutes doing nothing so you don't get dirty. And it feels like it's a week long. So that's the best part, right? Getting dressed and don't get dirty. And, unless, maybe the best part was dad getting ready first, and sitting in the car with it running, honking the horn every 15 seconds and yelling, hurry up, we're going to be late. By the way, guys, that doesn't work. <laughs> so if that's your strategy for getting your wife to hurry up, just go ahead and, and get rid of that one because you've got to find another way to do it. Hey, whatever you went through to get here today, we are glad you're here. And by the way, you look great, okay? Whether you bought something new or not. And, and I just, uh, since we're talking about getting ready, I got to ask the question of the day is simply this. Are you ready? Are you ready? I ask that because the people involved in the very first Easter were not ready. They're not ready at all. Jesus gathered his disciples on Thursday night before the crucifixion to celebrate the Passover with them. And they ate the meal and he looked at them and he said, hey, one of you is going to betray me. 
All of you are going to abandon me. And and, uh, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before tomorrow morning. And they all were like, no, we're not. We're going to stay with you. There's nothing you, you can do to make us leave. And they were not ready for the truth. And then the disciples and, and Mary and the women, they watched in horror as Jesus is betrayed and arrested and, and put on trial and condemned and crucified. And they watch him die and, and they weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for the pain. Even though Jesus had mentioned it. They weren't ready. And they grieved uh, because they weren't ready. And on Easter morning, they went to the tomb Well, let's just read the passage, and you decide for yourself whether or not they're ready. Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. So what do you think? Were they ready for the resurrection? No. They weren't ready for the resurrection. I mean, the women went to cover the the body, the dead body of Jesus with spices and oils. The the disciples, when when the women came and reported the tomb was empty, they dismissed it as an idle tale. Oh, yeah, right, sure, whatever. Peter went to the tomb and looked at it, and, and it says he went away marveling, wondering, but other gospels tell us he did not yet believe. They were not ready for the end of the story. God totally surprised them. Even though Jesus had told them at least three times this was going to happen. And they weren't ready. They weren't ready. The story was different than their expectations. So again, I I got to ask the question, are you ready? Are you ready? First of all, are you ready for the truth? Are you ready for the truth? The truth is God loves you. God loves you. No matter who you are, where you've been, what you've done, what you've been through, the ways that you have failed, the ways that you've rebelled against God, the mistakes you've made, uh, God loves you. And by the way, there's, there's not anything you can do to make him love you more. And there's really not anything you can do to make him love you less. And you don't have to get cleaned up and put your life together for God to love you. God loves you right now, who you are. That's the truth. God loves you and God forgives you. The moment you ask him to, God forgives you. He's not, you know, hanging out like some angry, you know, parent ready to ground you as soon as you make a mistake. He wants to forgive you. This is a message of grace. This is the truth. And and scripture says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. Everything we've ever done is forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. And the truth is God wants to bless you. He wants to lead you into life. He, he, in fact, he wrote it down so that we could be blessed. You want to know how to live a blessed life, how, a life that is full of joy and peace and hope? It, it's written down in this book that we're trying to give away called the Bible. And some of you are like, hey, you know, there's a bunch of commandments in there. Tell me what I can't do. And, and it's not like God's trying to deprive us of fun. I'm just telling you, it, it's, it's more like, hey, to your child, don't touch the hot stove. That's what God's telling us. He's telling us the ways that we can avoid the pain and the suffering and the heartache of life. He's saying, hey, if you'll follow me, I will bless you. But you gotta live my way, not your way to do that. That's the truth. 
The truth is God loves you, God forgives you, God wants to bless you, and God wants to give you eternal abundant life. But it's only available in Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself in the Gospel of John chapter 14 said this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You want to have life eternal? You want to have life abundant? Then Jesus said, look, this is the the way you can do that. You can believe in me. You can follow me. You can trust me and I will change your life. And then you can have a personal relationship with the living God, an intimate love relationship with him. See, the disciples, they weren't ready for the truth. They disagreed with Jesus when he told them, you'll betray me, you'll abandon me, you'll deny me. They weren't ready for the truth. When the women showed up with the report about the empty tomb, they dismissed it. So what about you? Are you ready for the truth? Do you agree with Jesus that he is the way to life? Are you ready? And are you ready for the pain? Uh, Have you noticed that life hurts? Anyone paid attention to that? I, you know, I, I've kind of noticed that as I get older, life hurts and it hurts more. Uh, some of you are too young to figure that out yet. You know, now it hurts for a little while and it goes away. But, you know, it used to be when I, I got, you know, it's not feeling good, then you know, go lay down. And now you lay down and you don't feel good laying down. It hurts to lay down and you got to get up because it hurts. I mean, life hurts. It hurts physically. You know, whether you get ac- uh, hurt in an accident or whether you get injured or whether you, you know, get sick, get a disease, life hurts. There's pain involved. In fact, a very wise man said, uh, life is pain. Anyone who tells you different is selling something. <laughs> See, we know. We, we, we've got pain. And we got emotional pain, right? Relational pain. Somebody in your life has betrayed you or, or rejected you or lied about you or, or, you know, just threw you under the bus. You know, there's all that kind of pain, and and we don't want the pain, but pain's part of life because we've been living in rebellion against God since Adam and Eve. We've been pouring the iodine in our life over and over and over again. And so our selfish choices and our self-destructive habits hurt us, and they hurt people that we care about. And other people's choices hurt us. See, that's the reality of the world we live in. And here's the thing, Jesus didn't promise to take the pain away, at least not immediately. Okay, heaven is a place where the pain is taken away. Because in heaven, the Bible tells us there's no more suffering or sorrow or death or pain because the old order of things is done away with and all things become new. So until the day we get there, we're living in a world filled with pain. And a lot of times we pray, right, God take away the pain. God, make it stop hurting. God, I don't, I don't want to feel like this. Take away the pain. And, and we kind of treat Jesus like he's a pain reliever, right? Okay, so take two Jesus and see if it's better in the morning. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't want to be your pain reliever. Jesus wants to be our pain redeemer. See, God wants to redeem our pain. Psalm 147 3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He doesn't stop us from experiencing broken hearts. He doesn't stop us from getting wounded, but He's there to heal us when it happens. See, God redeems our pain by taking the broken pieces of our lives and making something beautiful out of them. So when we're standing there in the rubble of betrayal or sickness or loss or hurt, uh, you know, our life has fallen apart uh, because of our choices or someone else's choices, God is there to scoop up all the broken pieces and shattered dreams of our life and make something beautiful out of them. That's what he does. That's what it means when we say God redeems the pain. The the perfect picture of this is Easter itself, the holiday we're celebrating today. How so? Think about it. The story begins with the pain of betrayal. There are false accusations. There is a gross miscarriage of justice as Jesus is condemned. Add to that the cruelty of, of being beaten, of people mocking him while he's on the cross, and the torturous death of crucifixion. And all of that pain is followed by what? The triumph of the resurrection. 
the triumph of the resurrection. God redeems our pain through Jesus' pain. He gives us life through Jesus' death and resurrection. And, and, and it's on the other side of the pain where God shows up and paints this picture of victory and beauty. And he'll do that in our lives too if we don't quit. So many times we get angry and we give up. Well, if that's how it's going to be, I'm walking out of here. I'm not going back to church. If that's how it's going to be, I'm going to stop believing in God. Hey, look, God's there and he's going to redeem your pain if you, if you won't get angry at him and you won't give up. And you'll be surprised because one day, maybe a few days later, like the resurrection was after the crucifixion, it may be down the road. You're going to praise God and say, look what God has done if you'll let him redeem the pain. If you'll trust God even when it hurts. Now, here's the crazy thing. Jesus told the disciples three times, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to evil men. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be raised from the dead. Got it? They didn't get it. Even when it happened, they weren't ready for the pain. So are you ready for the pain? Because God is waiting to redeem. And then finally, are you ready for the end? Are you ready for the end of the story? Your story. Now, you might think that's a morbid question to ask on Easter, right? Come on, preacher, this is Easter. Be happy. You're asking me if I'm ready for the end. Except last time I checked, Easter is the story of death and what happens after. So I thought, why not? Let's ask the question. Are you ready for the end? Because the disciples weren't ready for the end of the story. They didn't expect it to happen the way that it does. And Jesus challenged us. Matthew 24, he says, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And none of us knows when this life is going to end. If you've lived any length of time at all, you've lost loved ones. Somebody you care about, somebody that you were close to ha has died. And so you know the pain of grief. You know that life is fragile. So, None of us knows when the end's going to come. Are you ready? Now, the temptation is, because we're sitting in church, to answer, yes, I'm ready. Got this. But don't answer too quickly. You might not be as ready as you think. Jesus tells parable after parable about people who weren't ready. and Because he, he wants us to be ready. And, and a couple of years ago, I got to live out a parable of not being ready. Here, here's what happened. It was uh, after my 20th anniversary here at the church, and uh, I got a sabbatical. I got to take extra time off, and I planned, you know, the perfect vacation. Two weeks in paradise. I went to Hawaii. <sighs> so I... First week, kids are there, we're doing, you know, the, all the activities, you know, we're kayaking, we're, we're uh, enjoying the ocean and the snorkeling and the, the beaches and the sightseeing and the waterfalls, and, and we went zip lining through canyons. It was awesome. Then they flew home, some friends came out, we did all that fun stuff too, plus we played golf on these amazing golf courses. Uh, if you're a golfer, you'd appreciate that. Then we leave to come home, two weeks, not enough, but it was good. We're touching down in Las Vegas, and I look over at my wife, and I say, honey, uh, do you have your house key? And she said, I gave mine to the house sitter. She goes, don't you have your house key? And I said, uh, the kids drove the car home from the airport uh, last week, and they had my car house key attached to it, because we're riding back with our friends that joined us. So I'm starting to text as soon as you can, and I'm texting the house sitter, hey, don't lock the stuff in the house. Too late. She'd done it perfectly. You know, left that day because we were coming home, locked the keys in the garage door opener in the house. Call the neighbor, you know, who's got the emergency key. They're out of town. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock at night in Vegas. We got to get our stuff, drive back to Havasu, and we are locked out of our house. So the whole drive home, I'm like, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot, I'm an idiot. And, uh, and our friends are laughing, and they're like, hey, you can stay with us. We got an extra bedroom. It's not a problem. And so, you know, we roll into Havasu about 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we pull up to their house, open their garage door, and this wave of the most putrid odor you've ever smelled wafts out to us. Because uh, we're talking about gut-wrenching, uh, gag-inducing kind of smell because their, their little breaker thing in their, in their garage had tripped and their uh, refrigerator freezer, which had one thing in it, only one thing in it, had been off all week. And that one thing that was in it was fish. 
Did I mention it was July? <laughs> yeah, so there we are, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, taking that oh, fish out and, and trying to bag it up enough so that you can't smell it, spraying the air fresheners, opening up the house, trying not to gag while we're doing this. Can I just tell you that the trip did not end the way I planned? <laughs> Perfect trip, completely wrong ending. Um, don't let that be you. Don't let your trip end that way. You see, whether your life has, has happened exactly as you hoped it would and you're living uh, the, the dream, or whether your life has been a roller coaster of ups and downs and you're hanging on, or whether it has been one tragedy after another, be ready for the end. Because in the end, you don't want to be locked out living someplace that stinks. So be ready. Jesus told you he's the way, the truth, and the life. That, that the only way you can have life eternal is through him. So are you ready to follow Jesus? Are you ready to declare your faith in Jesus in baptism? Are you ready to let God change your life? Because he's ready to change it. But it begins when you struggle with the question, are you ready? You know the truth, you know life hurts, you know God redeems, you know the end is coming, but have you made that commitment to follow Jesus, to let him change you? Uh, before you leave today, there's going to be people available to talk to you about that. Uh, we're going to continue worshiping in just a moment, but at the end of the service, there's going to be members of our prayer team up at the front if you want to talk to somebody. There's going to be some pastors over in this room over here to my left if you want to talk to somebody. Uh, myself and some of the other pastors will be out front handing out free water bottles. Uh, talk to someone and make sure that you're ready because that's what we hope to give you today is that assurance that you know the living God and that he has given you hope and forgiveness and changed your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. <laughs> you know us exactly as we are, and yet you love us anyway. You, you forgive us of all of our sins simply because we ask, and I pray today that every person in this room would know intensely the love and the hope of Christ, that they would be able to say with full truthfulness, it is well with my soul. So let us sense your presence. Let us know your life, Jesus, because you're the only one who can give it. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue worshiping our God.